Hello, and welcome to Rise of the Data Cloud. Today's episode features an interview with Will Sprunt, principal data scientist and former CIO at Deliveroo. Will has decades of experience from across multiple industries. From food to transportation, Will is an expert on data. In this episode, Will talks about the pandemic's impact on the food industry and the innovation that has come because of it, the nuances of leadership in tech, the data behind delivery, and much more. So please enjoy this interview between Will Sprunt and your host, Steve Hamm. So Will, it's great to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. Thanks thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. Hey, a lot of our listeners probably have not heard of Deliveroo. So it'd be great if you would start off by describing the company and its businesses. Absolutely. So our mission is to build the definitive online food company. We want to be the platform that people turn to whenever they think about food. We're well known outside the US as a delivery company like DoorDash for your US listeners or uh, Meituan in China or Rappi in Latin America. And and, uh, we operate in 12 different markets with over 115,000 food merchants more than 100,000 riders and millions of customers across the uh, across the globe. We started out in the UK, and we've since expanded all over Europe, all over Asia and the Pacific region. And despite being a, a global company, we really think about this as a you know, neighborhood business. Delivery started in the London neighborhood of Chelsea back in 2013, and we've got a proven track record of that global expansion through that hyperlocal lens. From the very beginning, we recognize that to succeed, we need to get the proposition right neighborhood by neighborhood. So that's something that's really, really stuck with us. But the other thing which we think sets us apart is a real focus on food. A lot of other providers in the space operate primarily as logistics companies. And you can see a lot of companies trying to become delivery systems for lots of sorts of products. But we think food is special. It's, it's really hard to do well because people have a real emotional connection to what they're eating. And every second counts in getting a good experience, whether that's like making sure your ice cream gets to you before it's melted or making sure that uh, your, your burger is still piping hot. So that means to get it right, we've got to be obsessed with that experience and, and specifically with food. You know, we've had really rapid growth, but we think we're only just getting started. Bringing the food category online is a, a huge market opportunity. And the way we think about it is, is really simple. There's, there's 21 times that people are eating most weeks, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, seven days a week. Um, and right now, less than one in 21 of those transactions take place, takes place online. And we're working to change that. So a huge market opportunity, both locally and globally. That's really great to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, over the past year and a half, we've had this terrible thing, the the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's still affecting businesses, people, Mm -hmm. you know, individuals, communities. How has it affected your company, its operations and also its strategy? Yeah. It's such a huge industry-defining moment. And I think before we can talk about deliver. Actually, we have to talk a little bit about kind of the wider context. You said it's been a, well, first a terrible tragedy, but really a, a category defining moment for a lot of different industries. But in food in particular, we've seen it rock the industry from, from top to bottom. Overnight, restaurants across the globe were close to f- forced to close. And those traditional restaurants had to think of new ways to adapt and survive. And that's true whether you're trying to open a restaurant in New York or operate in London or do it in Hong Kong. And the common thread we saw throughout all of these different places was massive innovation. Obviously, we we really believe in a company. It's something we do an awful lot of. But it's been amazing to see actually the industry adapt and find new, new ways of operating in, in that time. So then to zoom in on us, innovation is the best response to that sort of disruption. And we were really focused on finding new ways to serve the three sides of our marketplace. So what can we do that's best for customers? What can we do that's best for riders? What can we do that's best for, for, for our restaurants? And then in addition, what can we do which is supporting the community? There was a point where across Europe, like close to 80% of restaurants closed back in early 2020. And the majority of, of our offering just wasn't there. We could see our, our partners really struggling. So first, we wanted to take action to them to help them out. We brought new technology to them, you know, guide them through the new rules where we had an element of industry expertise because we'd done it a number of times with other partners, provided really, really clear guidance for how to stay safe, amped up the amount of additions, our delivery-only kitchens, and made sure that they could get food to the customers. We also wanted to support our national health service in, in the UK where, where we're based and who are working really, really hard to keep people safe through the, through the pandemic. So we set up an initiative to deliver a million meals to frontline NHS staff. Coming back to the, I guess, the business operations, 
what we saw was that delivery became in, in a lot of cases restaurants only channel for trading and as such became a, a you know a lifeline so so it was something that specifically for independence was was one of the main ways they could kind of get through this really tough period and and it was really fantastic to be able to help and to grow our business at the same time it turned into this huge opportunity because as everyone was quarantining it, it just accelerated the adoption of online food delivery probably by you know a couple of years because people who you know hadn't thought about trying us were now in a situation where it's like wow i i i need a way to get food or i need a way to have a have a treat or a reward at the end of like a really hard week's worth of work and you know, we've seen that through in our results we've just seen 88 percent year-on-year growth in the second quarter of 2021 the one just finished and in that same period orders in the uk and ireland grew 94 percent year-on-year which is is pretty fantastic because you know we have been in this market since 2013 we've been established we've got quite a lot of penetration in some ways you could kind of look at that business and think this is mature risks at scale but it basically doubled in the course of just a year the whole thing of you know going from being kind of an addendum to mm. uh, of the restaurants to being a, a a real essential strategic partner and using data to do that is really fascinating so thank you for that information I wanted to switch uh, back to Deliveroo's business and, and expansion mm-hmm. plans, stuff like that for a minute. I know that the company went public last year. And how has that affected its operations, its ability to expand, its strategy, all those kinds of things? Yeah, absolutely. First off, we're, we're really proud to have listed on the London Stock Exchange. It's the place we call home. And we're extremely confident about the long-term value of the equity. It's a pleasure having grown up in this market to now be part of it as a, as a public-facing company. The IPO itself was was always about setting up the company for the long term, which we believe we have done. We capitalized really, really well as a result of the event. We've raised a, a billion pounds and we continue to gain market share in the UK and in our other markets around the world. But at the same time, being a public company means we have responsibilities to our shareholders and to report our results in public markets. So we can't just invest or expand for the sake of pure growth without a view to the long-term profitability of those actions. We have to be really sure it's a good use of the cash that we've been we've been trusted with we've got a lot of options on on how we could invest it's easy to jump to thoughts of like oh brand new stuff brand new countries brand new products but there's there's loads of potential opportunities we have to weigh that up against you know should we go deeper into our existing countries should we increase the footprint of delivery additions which is our our turnkey uh, real estate solution for restaurants which you know some people they call them cloud kitchens or dark kitchens or whatever. Uh, and, and then how much should we invest in that grocery opportunity, which, which we talked about a little bit in the previous section. We've also got our plus program, our membership service, which requires a careful thought and use of that funding as well. How much of that cash should we go back in creating additional you know, value layers for our consumers? The one thing I can definitely say that we've announced just is it, it's really unlocked our ability to invest more in technology and, and put additional resources into growing our team into a world-leading organization. We've recently you know, announced that we'll be adding 400 new tech roles in a team, everything from engineers to data scientists, designers, data engineers. We're talking about Snowflake today. And adding the, the capability here is, is really key for us to be able to scale and, and, and drive up the growth of our platform. It means being able to build better products and having those benefits really stack on top of each other in an exponential way. It means having better data capabilities across all of our teams so we can make higher quality decisions. And, and it means opening up new avenues for the business. Yeah. So you just talked about you know, greatly expanding the, the, the technology capabilities, the, the manpower mm. or human power of the company. Hey, so let's get into your role a little bit. I know that you were the CIO for a while, but now you're the principal data scientist. What does that transition mean? What's your day-to-day job like today? Yeah. As anyone who's worked in a startup or a scale-up, I, I guess we'll relate to, I've been at Delivery for about four and a half years now. So I've had a lot of different roles in that time. And a lot of that is depending on, on kind of what the the most pressing problems of the company are at any given moment. And and also where where kind of my skills fit best. In in some ways, I don't think my role's changed an awful lot. It's It's about using our data in the best possible way. And it's to be honest, about putting out fires in a lot of cases. The CIO role was, was quite interesting because it was something we, we hadn't had up until that point, but we realized there was there was a clear gap in the organization. We didn't really have a lot of central governance over our third-party application stack. There wasn't a lot of coherent thought around 
how we use technology in parts of the business to improve productivity outside of the uh, the engineering and tech team. There wasn't the most thorough governance onto things like our devices or our hardware strategy around the business. So the role itself was actually about spinning up a lot of those teams and getting to a place where we had maturity, we had a strategy, and then finding the right leaders to kind of take those departments on and take them from not just a zero to one, which I think I'm, I'm reasonably good at, but one to two to 10 to 100. The switch to principal data scientist has been, has been really interesting as well. Data science has always been something which has been the, I guess, the common thread throughout my career. Having been working with data, I guess, for the past, whatever it is now, 15 years, I'm not even sure if I was called a data scientist to start with. I think people call me an analyst or, or a strategy person, but the, the common thread is always, how can we use data in, in the most effective way? The transition actually happened last year in quite a, a stressful and, and challenging situation for us as a company. As part of the response to COVID, initially we had a like quite a challenging period where, as we said before, 80% of restaurants were closed, although it's turned out really well in the end. There's a huge amount of uncertainty in the world at that point. And one of the actions that we took was actually looking at our organization and saying how much do we want to invest in the overheads that we have? And we had this really tough period where we, where we had to make redundancies. It was, it was honestly one of the, the, the hardest leadership challenges I think I've ever had. But one thing that came out of it as an interesting uh, opportunity was, was I was at the time uh, uh, you know, managing still quite, quite a large team, um, not quite as large as, as, as kind of it had been at the peak of the, the CIO role, where I think it was about 120 people. It was kind of beyond my, my ability to remember everyone's personalities particularly effectively and we're making all these cuts to make make make, make everyone's jobs harder and some of what we needed was not necessarily more management although more management is obviously really important but the way to still get impact and still get value out of our data and add more firepower to the teams so i talked to this this over a lot with uh, dan our cto and decided uh, I, i could actually move back into a role as an individual contributor and, and that's been great. Obviously, it, it coincided pretty well with our preparations for IPO. And there was a whole lot of work which needed doing, which involved data, but which had a, you know, a, a need for, for confidentiality or sensitivity around it. But since then, it's, it's, it's meant getting to move on to problems with, re- with really high leverage and ones which typically cut across different groups. I think the most interesting part of, part of it is actually getting a, a chance to maybe define an alternate model of, uh, of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you, you put out fires essentially, and big <laughs> ones. You don't put out the little fires, you put out the big ones. It sounds like very cool. Hey, you have had a, a very interesting and varied career so far. You talked about doing this for 15 years. Mm-hmm. You started right out of college or actually in college. You started a number of food and beverage businesses. You've also worked for a number of tech companies, including Zipcar. What are the most important leadership lessons that you've learned along the way and how are you applying them at Deliveroo? Mm -hmm. I think, I think I should start off with uh, the food businesses. Sometimes I talk about them as, as as kind of my fake MBA because uh, going into something like that straight out of college, the first thing I did was I saw all of my friends go into like grad programs or big industry things that looked kind of unappealing. So I, I went and made chocolate for two years. And in retrospect, I think it's, it's one of the best career choices I've, I've, I've ever made. It got me into a situation where I would need to do everything, which sounds like kind of arrogant, I guess. But at the same time, it, it's almost a forced position. If you're the owner of a small business, if you're not doing payroll, no one's doing payroll. Uh, if, if you're not doing advertising, no one's doing advertising. If you're not planning out your cash flow, no one is doing any of those things. And I think what it what it taught me really, really quickly was not that, not quite that nothing is hard, but nothing is impossible if you apply yourself to it. And actually get into the stage where you are maybe consciously incompetent, you know, how much, uh, how out of your depth you are, but you can still string yeah. your way along just about yeah. is, is super valuable. And it's, it's something that stuck with me a whole lot as a, both a leadership lesson, but also as a, a kind of general work policy. That's really interesting. You kind of, you kind of build confidence and competence at the same time incrementally Mm. but through challenges so that's really cool i think having come through a situation where i was forced to do so many of these different things it's taken the fear a lot out of out of trying something trying something new yeah as as, there's a lot of people who i can see early early in their career and and they've maybe specialized the whole load and think okay i'm 
I'm an accountant. There's no way I can do any of this like data science stuff. And actually it's like, if you learned a little bit, you'd, you'd be fantastic. Or I'm a data scientist. I don't really have the strength in this kind of user research background. It's like, actually if you could take a run at it and your skills in data science would probably make you pretty applicable and pretty strong at that second thing. I think it's really important to build kind of a T-shaped set of skills where you have depth in your area of specialization, but you can cut across a lot of different areas as well. Right. Right. What about in the tech industry? What kind of lessons have you learned there? Yeah, I think inside tech, it's a little bit hard for me to say which were lessons were tech and which were actually working in larger companies. Uh But getting through to the idea of actually perspective and empathy and communication style was 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 really big. Everyone comes at problems with with very different perspectives. And obviously from from my background, I naturally gravitate towards data and there was a, a whole lot of awkward meetings I had earlier in my career where it's like, well, the data is saying this, why, why wouldn't you believe me? Or I don't know what I'm saying wrong to, 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 to make you see this. And actually understanding there are, there are so many different strategic motivations which can come through from, from any of these different angles where data at the end of the day is only a thread of a story. And in tech, and especially in, in, in tech in the last five years, it will only get you so far. Uh, you have to have that flexibility and constant learning mindset to be able to apply yourself to new problems as they come up. Sometimes some of those things are, are only achievable by by feeling or by group cohesion, where actually which decision you make is not even necessarily the most important thing. The most important thing is that you've all made the decision together and you've decided on a direction and you're striving towards it. After that, you can only get incrementally better and remain flexible in your approach to kind of keep on overcoming challenges as they come up. Yeah, that's interesting. I I think those kinds of skills are really undervalued within Mm. large organizations, but they're absolutely critical. And we see it again and again, how groups, whether they're five people or 500, Mm. can be dysfunctional if leadership from top to bottom doesn't have that kind of sense of empathy and a sense of, you know, reading, reading the room kind of and, and responding to the individuals and the group, the way they need to be responded to. So I think that's really cool. Now, I I know that Deliveroo was it, it's a cloud native company, so it didn't have to go through all the pain and agony of moving the data from on prem into the cloud. So, mm-hmm. so you, you you missed out on all that fun. <laughs> uh, so, but tell me when and why did you start using Snowflake? Yeah, so we started using Snowflake back in the end of 2017, start of 2018. Mm-hmm. As you were saying before, we luckily didn't have the decision process where we had to move from on-prem into the cloud. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how we would have managed, ever managed scaling or, or managed to have the sort of growth that we had if we had to also manage our architecture from a hardware perspective in the background as well. Coming back to the, to, to the, to the Snowflake migration, we were having issues for our existing data platforms, and specifically the data platforms which our, our, our end users would interact with. The, the things that we were seeing were problems with concurrency, problems with runtime, and, and ultimately, it was coming down to how accessible could we make data for everyone in the company. We used to have a period that we call the Monday morning madness, where probably about a thousand different people would descend on the data warehouse and start running queries through our BI platform. It would just generate this huge spike in the amount of queries that we were exposing the data warehouse to. And we still wanted to have that data availability. We thought, actually, this event of people really going after data and being really excited by it and wanting to self-serve and wanting to have this democratized access is not something that you choke off and you go, okay, well, how can we make this work with a smaller footprint? Or how can we truncate the amount of data which, which people have access to in order to make this pass through our systems correctly? And we selected Snowflake just because of the ability to take that concurrency and to take that shift in demand up and down, depending on what it was that people wanted at right at the minute. Yeah, yeah, the elastic cloud, right? And you only pay for what you use. Those are, exactly I think are, are really keys. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get down into the gritty of it. Uh, could you describe a couple of the most important ways you're using the Snowflake technology and what kind of results you've gotten? Yeah, it's a little bit hard actually to even pick out which are the most important ways because really technology and data underpins almost everything we do in the business. It's it's so fundamental to our logistics and has brought down our costs massively over the years. It's fundamental to iterating on our products as we experiment on pretty much everything we can. 
and it means we can prove the value of all the changes we're making. It's fundamental to our decision making across the whole business to make sure that it's not just tech, but everyone um, is data first and data driven in their approach. To give a, a really contained example, I think we can we can take a look at additions, which we we talked a bit about before, which is our, our turnkey real estate for uh, for restaurants, aka cloud kitchens or dark kitchens. So from right from inception, we've got a a fun data problem. It's where do we decide to even put the sites? Because we actually have to open these things up and make sure that we can serve customers from them. And there's loads of wait, wait, actually. Oh yeah, we'll sure, take sure. a step back. I don't think people probably they, they don't know what delivery additions are. So yeah, explain it very basically, okay? Definitely. It, it, yeah. it really represents what we think of as kind of the operating system for a restaurant. Mm. We buy the site, we kit out the kitchens, we put in everything that people need from specialized pizza ovens to wok burners. We, we make it so that if a brand wants, wants to set up a, a new site, they can just walk in there from day one. All they have to supply are the ingredients and the chefs. And it's been really transformative for some of the relationships of our strongest brands, because we know that there's a huge advantage in getting a brand which has been performing really, really well in one area. To drop into one of these kitchen sites, they don't have to open up a brand new restaurant, but suddenly we've got Shake Shack in a place which never had it before, or we've got Three Uncles, my favorite barbecue meat restaurant place from around the corner, accessible to a whole group of new people who, who would never have it before. And from the restaurant side, it makes a whole lot of sense as well, because the cost of doing one of these openings is, is dramatically lower than it would be setting up a whole brand new site and, and, and working out if they can even make any money off delivery in the area. Yeah. So how do you use data to make these places work? Mm. So really, it comes from inception all the way through to operation. First, before we can even pick what it is we're going to do with them, we have to find a site. And, and that's informed by data. Where do we think we have opportunities, either because there is a, a kind of lack in the consumer offering there where we're missing a, a great burger restaurant or we're missing a great Indian restaurant, and we think there's a, there's, there's a good place. But also from an operational perspective, it's like, where do we think is going to be a good site, which is going to mean that we can deliver efficiently, mean that we can operate very, very good deliveries and choose the sites based on that. Secondarily, then you have to pick the, the brands which are going to be in those sites, because actually in, in almost all of these sites we're, we're oversubscribed so finding out who is the right partner to go into that restaurant is also a data back decision and it's about finding the right fit between the, the brand and the specific area then we've got a decision about how we choose to surface it to customers so we have these sites they go into all the rest of our restaurant list and now they're going to be part of what the consumer can look at and choose from on the website how should that rank for different customers how should that be presented for different individuals and then we also give data back to the partners and we can, we can give them a lot more information, a lot more granularity than we can for uh, people who are operating in their own kitchens, just because we have more oversight on, onto their operations. And that means we get more consistent preparation times of meals, more accurate predictions of how long things are going to take, tends to make, mean that our, our kind of riders spend less time waiting at those sites, tends to mean that customers get a better experience overall. And, and we can measure all of those things as an output and feed that back into the process. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting about how tightly you're operating with your customers now. I mean, you're almost like interwoven completely in some of these situations. Mm-hmm. So, so data sharing is obviously very important. It's a key feature of Snowflake. So does Deliveroo plan on doing a lot of data sharing with business partners kind of through the Snowflake platform, or is that something you do separately? It's something we use the data from Snowflake for, but tend to do it separately. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we, we obviously have a whole bunch of products which restaurants and partners will interact with in the course of their operations, whether that's the tablet which sends them information on which, which orders are coming up, or whether that's uh, sales reports coming through from account managers on a regular basis. And yeah, a lot of that data is, is kind of sourced from Snowflake, but we tend to, tend to have our own front ends, which we kind of put on the top. But yeah, as, as you mentioned before, like this is, it's something which is a really important feature in these sites, but is, is actually just generally part of the operating model, which we, which we want to have with our restaurant partners. Um, and especially in the course of the pandemic, it's, it's meant that we've worked even closer with them before. We've got regular insights and key stats that we can send them on performance. You know, we've got during order stats, that we can send them to let them know about the customer that they're serving. And we've got a restaurant hub, which is that 
I'm saying one of those products that we've uh, we've built so that they can they can log in and have a look at their performance right, right. over time. Um, no, that's really cool. And actually, one thing I'd love to talk about as well before we uh, before we move on is yeah. uh, we've also been developing what we call our, our our signature products. So this is actually providing delivery technology and logistics capabilities directly to those key partners. So the restaurants themselves, like they have their own front end, but the logistics and the food delivery itself is being backed up by delivery technology. And of course, that means there are partners in more ways than one. Right. They become customers of that. Oh, interesting. And you make money that way. You charge them for these services. There are two key things from, uh, from that we get from a service. Uh, one is, yeah, for sure, it's a direct product. You know, we get, we get direct benefits in, 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 in cash flow. But the other is really strengthening our partnership. You know, we think it's really important to have the partners who are on Signature on our core platform. We think it's really important that they are able also to continue to serve their customers in the way that they want to. And having Signature really strengthens both sides of it. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Good. Hey, no discussion of uh, <laughs> of data scientists would be complete without a discussion of algorithms. <laughs> and yeah, and I understand that Deliveroo has created a collection of of core analytics algorithms called Frank. I'm curious why Frank, but <laughs> tell us what Frank does and why it's so important to the company. Cool. I'll, I'll get to the name at the end and we can talk, talk a bit about that. Right, right. But yeah, if you think about ordering a takeaway yourself, you know, you think about a restaurant and you tell them what food you want and they may deliver to you. It's the traditional model. It's the model which Grubhub for the most part does in the US, just connecting a single, a single customer with a single restaurant and letting the restaurant work out how they want to serve, serve that. But for us, there's an extra side to the market where we have riders who are separate from the restaurant and they're going to deliver the food. And it's the relationships between those three sides, which makes it complicated, interesting, fun, mm. all of those things. Um, yeah. If you have one rider, it's really effective easy. effective too, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you have one rider, it's, it's, it's really easy. You know, the food's ready, you just send them. But we've got loads of riders and loads of customers. So, so you've got to make that decision on who should pick what and you don't just have to decide the right pick for that one order. You have to make sure that every order gets the right rider. When you've got thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of possible interrelated combinations in you know, every single minute, you, know, you can just send the closest rider when the food is ready, but that might actually slow down other orders that you have more. So you have to look at the whole picture to make your picks. And as you quite rightly mentioned, like if you make your pick right, the network of riders as a whole, becomes way, way more efficient than any single rider or any single restaurant can ever be on, on, on the And the algorithm which makes those decisions is, is, is what we call Frank. Interesting. It's really a, a, a massive systems and systems modeling problem that you're mm-hmm. solving. Really cool. Exactly that. Exactly okay. Right. So Frank, why the name? Oh, yeah. So if you know uh, an old, old sitcom in the US called Taxi with Danny DeVito and Ted Danson, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, mm. you know, Dan DeVito plays a character called Louie, who's always on the yeah. phone dispatching out taxis. And it's like, hey, we've got, a, you know, we've got an order here, go here. We've got an order here, go here. And the very first version of ride dispatch algorithm was called Louie because it would just be the thing which would send out, send out riders all the time. When we had a new version, which was trying to do this in a much more sophisticated way and looking at the holistic network altogether, we had to come up with a way and with a, with a good name for that. And so naturally, we looked at Dan DeVito and who he's been more recently in a sitcom and went to Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and there's Frank. Yeah, interesting. So your system ultimately is a very sophisticated dispatcher. Exactly that, exactly that. Right. right. How do you see the cloud-based data analytics, you know, all these technologies affecting business and even society? Mm-hmm. I think the the first trend to think about is, is kind of that democratization of data. So, you know, we, right. we talked about our, our Monday morning madness where you, know, you have a thousand people trying to run queries on a database. And it's like, okay, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty different. You only have to think uh, 10 years back and, you know, anyone who could code in SQL was like a rarity in the organization. You think, you know, 30 years back and it's like, I mean, even 20 years back. And it's like, it's pretty rare that someone knows how to use macros. You look 30 years back, it's pretty rare that someone knows how to use Excel. You look 40 years back, it's rare that someone knows how to use a computer. So you do the same trend, but extrapolate it forward. And I think the amount of familiarity and and the expectation that people will have for familiarity in business is, is going to change dramatically. What I think is is really interesting about that is, is it then changes the sorts of problems which 
people think about as data problems um, as a, a consistent model where it's like there is hard data, therefore we can apply data science skills to it. But actually you're seeing more and more how do we how do we extract the uh, the kind of the soft ideas, things like sentiment analysis or things like brand position or things like social information and turn that into stuff you can use for data. And I think the 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 most concrete example of this is, is I hope going to come down in actually hardening up some of the stuff we've talked about or some of the stuff which the the, the world is talking about around ESG. Mm. You see everyone from investors to people looking for their first job saying, I really know what the environmental and the social and, and, and kind of the governance situation of an organization or a, you know, a country looks like. But then when you try and extract information from it, you either get these slightly weird like checkbox exercises or these really obtuse things saying like this organization has been rated two stars out of five and actually mm. there's a real opportunity with the awareness around data and the willingness to apply it to hard social pro- problems to specify what we mean by social impact whether that's equality of opportunity whether that's amount of suffering generated per per dollar of capital whatever the, whatever the objective happens to be and we can start transitioning these things from I believe, or I think about this to actually, we really want to target this. And I think that that could be, that could be pretty cool. So how exactly will, does data help people appreciate wine? So I think this comes back to something we were talking about in the previous section where the application of data to soft problems actually makes them more defined and more targetable. And at least for me, more enjoyable. So Drinking wine is you know, purely a qualitative experience. You have a sip and it's delicious or it's not delicious. And that's kind of what you get from it as a first impression. But if you talk to a wine expert, they'll often say things like, oh, I can detect subtle flavors of this and aromas of, 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 of that. And as a, a kind of you know, lay person, you may initially not, not get any of that. But what's interesting is the actual active description and the education of people on on kind of what memories it is they're evoking or what taste it is they are getting actually changes your experience, your perception of the thing which you're you're experiencing. Another one of my personal hobbies is actually perfume. It falls very much into the same space. I think it's really interesting because as a novice, all you can get is it smells nice or not nice, or it smells maybe like woody or it smells fresh. When you are able to break those components down into more defined notes, actually, it gives you more appreciation of what it is that you like and don't like. And I, th- I think that that same transformation has happened in a bunch of places. Like people can talk, uh, you know, for hours on end about like different cuts in clothes or different shapes in bags. And I don't seem to get any of it. But like the the availability of the language actually changes the perception of the product and. In, in turn, I think, increases the the appreciation and, and the levels of nuance that you can get in it. So I think wine is especially interesting because you have applications like Vino, which are doing a fantastic job educating people about these nuances and these these flavors and doing it in a really unpretentious and straightforward way. And, and it comes back to like accessibility of this data. It's taking something that is very exclusive knowledge or perceived as very grandiose or selective or exclusive knowledge and putting it into the hands of people and actually making it way more accessible and accessibility in my view almost always leads to good things we'll have better wine producers better wine appreciators well i'm not quite getting the the, i mean one connect the dots here so Mm -hmm. in this case the precise descriptor words are the data in question so how does analyzing that data lead an individual to, to buy the right wine right that's a great question <laughs> it like to me it it, com- it comes down to you've you've actually extracted data points from the, from this and are able to make a decision if you look at descriptions of wine bottles you might see something described as as you know fresh and fruity and if that's all you get that's not a very detailed description of that wine right, right. if you have fresh and fruity layer one of data You've looked it up on an app and actually it will tell you layer two is this is a this is a semillon from this region in the Loire Valley raised at this altitude. And you know that by connecting the dots, 
that means certain things about the characteristics of that wine. Right. Okay, right. cool. That's extra information. And if you also have the awareness that in this case, fresh means really, really dry and citrus notes, and you've had the awareness to also think about wine that way previously, you can then connect the dots. So it's it's creating additional accessibility for data. Not everyone's going to want to use that data, of course, but right. it, it gives gives anyone a chance to interact with it and and to build up their their knowledge of of, of wine or perfume or whatever they want. Right, right. No, that's very good. That's fun. All right. Well, Will, it's been great talking to you today. It's really been fascinating. And I mean, really a lot of information. Thank you so much. I mean, to me, the most interesting part was when you talked about additions. I had no idea you you guys were doing that. And then then mm. to to hear how, I mean, these are essentially data-driven kitchens. Exactly. Because right. we, we talk about data-driven business. So really cool. I mean, using data, everything from selecting the place to the menus, to the who, who you put in one, to the, the routes and all that kind of stuff, optimizing. It's really fascinating stuff. And I think it's also very accessible stuff for, for the podcast listeners. So thank you so much for being with us today. No, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for, for having me. And, and uh, uh, you know, glad, glad we got to chat a fair bit about wine as well. <laughs> I'm going to go drink some. Well, that's an excellent plan. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Snowflake, the data cloud company. Inside the data cloud, organizations unite their siloed data, discover and securely share data, and execute diverse analytic workloads across multiple clouds. Learn more at snowflake.com slash podcast.